Hello, everybody. Um, welcome again to another 12 Petals Fireside Chat. Um, today, we're going to be talking about leadership and some of its less explored challenges. Uh, I'm Justin Kim, your facilitator again. And with us for this chat are Tiffany Chang and Jennifer Barton. Um, yep, you guys can wave. Uh, Tiffany, Tiffany Chang is a Taiwanese American um, internationally recognized conductor currently serving as associate professor at Berkeley College of Music and conductor at Oberlin Conservatory. Uh, she's also an outspoken panelist and speaker with an active blog, conductorsceo.com, where she shares her thoughts and experiences on effective leadership. So she's got a lot to say on this stuff. We're very excited to have her thoughts uh, tonight. Um, and Jennifer is a patron engagement and revenue specialist who has held senior fundraising leadership positions at the Baltimore and Jacksonville symphonies. Um, she's a frequent participant and presenter at arts conferences, and she was one of seven in the inaugural class of the Emerging Leaders Program with the League of American Orchestras just a few years ago. So we have uh, two really, really experienced leaders here tonight, and uh, we're just going to be talking about leadership and, and some of the challenges and um, some of the surprising stuff, insider knowledge. Um, so we'll do that for about an hour, and then at the end of it, there'll be Q&A, so anybody who's in the audience is welcome to queue up some questions. Feel free to place them in the chat or message them to any of the facilitators or administrators and, and we'll relay that. Yep. Um, all right. So I think the most logical place to start would be for if each of you guys, Jennifer and Tiffany, could share kind of just like a brief like story of when you first started taking on leadership and and what that was like for you and and kind of how your perception of it changed, maybe some pre, uh, preconceived notions about leadership that you had going in, and then, um, and then some of the issues that, or, or surprising things that you learned as you were getting more into your role. Uh, so let's just go in, I guess, alphabetical order. Jennifer, you can go first. <laughs> Tiffany, unless you're like queued up with one that you wanna. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so actually, I think that one of the earliest leadership experiences that I had in my career uh, was at the Baltimore Symphony. I, we call ourselves boomerangs when we were here and then came back. Um, so I took a seven year gap in between my two times here. And um, we've, we had this donor project. These donors came to us and said, we really want to start a running team. Uh, to support the VSO. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, this is fine. Um, and my boss was like, no, we need to make this VSO branded. Like it can't get out of control. So me and my, you know, 23 year old wisdom, um, I was like, okay, let's make this into something. Um, and what ended up happening was it turned into a huge project. We had a hundred um, runners, we raised $50,000. Um, and Marin Alsa ran in it, which was really cool. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, she's the first woman music director of a major American orchestra, and she was our music director until this year. And um, it really was a lesson for me about leadership because it showed that you don't need to be the person in the very top seat or even like three seats down from that to really be leading something that makes people feel good and drives them to uh, positively impact your institution. And I think that I've just kind of held on to that community spirit and also, you know, in the way that I've empowered other people and really just encouraged them to do kind of the, the same thing that I've done. Uh, so I guess that was kind of my first um, moment of being like, yeah, this is, this is leading. It's just getting it done. So taking initiative, not, not needing to necessarily be endowed with power. Right. Sounds like. Right. Great. Yeah. That's yeah, a great well, way to kick it's, it off. yeah. It's funny how, you know, your story, it seems like that you fell into the role of being a leader and 
and you you didn't say you, you didn't wake up one day and say oh i'm gonna be a leader i've decided <laughs> i've decided that i'm gonna be a leader and i put a stake in the ground right and yes. and i feel like that it, it, it it's funny how that works because the people who um want to be leaders they often think that 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 they have to make that claim that they are a leader um but what i've learned is that leadership is not about the title or what people call you but it's about your actions and what you do and how you impact the people mm-hmm. around you um so in my story is that i am originally a cellist um a play cello growing up and I never really thought about being a conductor at all. I wanted to study cello performance and I went to my undergrad to study cello performance and music education. Um, I was very inspired by uh, my teachers and conductors that I've worked with as a cellist. And I thought, well, I I, I also want to inspire other people like they did. And I didn't call it leadership. I just thought, well, I wanted to impact people. I wanted to, I wanted them to feel good about what they're doing. I wanted them to know that what they're doing is important and matters and has 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 significance. So I, um, in college, I was really interested in, I, I became interested in a lot of other areas of music. So I went in for cello, but then I also studied composition because I was like, well, you know, I. I'll just try this out, this thing out. And so I did a minor in composition. I also studied music theory quite. Um, I was a nerd, you know, and I I really love that aspect of music, analyzing and kind of thinking about uh, uh, being a reverse engineer and like taking a finished product and figuring out how it was put together. So all of those interests lend itself well to my becoming interested in conducting because it was the perfect way to encompass all of those interests that I have. Um, and I just kind of fell into conducting because I was interested in doing all those things. Just doing one thing, playing cello was not satisfying. Just thinking about composition was not satisfying. It, and so that's kind of how it came about. And it's, and I think that I am still learning every single day about what leadership means and what it means, what it is to be a leader, what it is to um, to have to have that impact on the people. So, so um, I am, I just feel like that it's hard for me to define leadership because it changes like from day to day for me. That's awesome. Uh, Tiffany, I think between the two of us, we probably had every possible music major that you could because mine was like collaborative piano and then education and then history. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that you're right there. There's there is actually a certain amount of um, expertise that I think is part of leadership um, that kind of adds to the credibility of what you're saying. It's not necessarily always a requisite piece, but um, being able to have the credibility of walking the walk and earning that is, I think, really, um, really critical to being a, a leader. Uh, especially somebody who really impacts um, other people and brings them along uh, in, in a position like yours or mine. So thanks for for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add that I, um, you know, in my in an, in an in an effort to expand my knowledge of leadership, I became really really interested. Uh, several years ago in exploring leadership ideas from like the business context. And I just thought, well, you know, it's interesting what these business leaders are doing with, with the, as CEOs of their companies, um, wh- whether they're startups or, you know, very established um, multi-decade long companies. And I just became really interested in like listening to like all the talks that I could find and like reading all the books that I, that 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 I could find about how they view leadership and and I realized wow these things can really apply to my work as a leader on the podium in you know in the artistic world and and I thought for a long time about um, transplanting I guess those ideas over and I was I'm I'm always surprised that that I think other industries have moved forward so much in 
cultivating um, definitions and practical and good practices of leadership while I think the music industry is you know have not they haven't fo- it, it hasn't focused on that as much and so that that is a big impetus for my work um, both what I want to do on the podium and also off the podium smiling because I'm looking at Christina who has you know worked with both of us at this point through all MBA and then also Justin has picked up this thread that's been running through probably your prep conversations my prep conversations all of the MBA you know all the MBA work that we did and uh, it's true it's not leadership is not really celebrated as a practice in the orchestra world and it shows. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that to me to sound so negative, but um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. That's neat space must be made for it. Uh, if we're going to catch up. Right. I wonder um, if, you know, from your perspective, Jennifer, what do you feel like is causes that negligence, you know, of think of focus on leadership? Well, um, we've got an hour, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, there are a few different things that I think go into it. Um, and I, when I, when I say these, I don't mean them in a pejorative way, knowing that you're in education. I'm sure that, you know, I think that now higher education is starting to address this, but I think that traditional, a lot of older uh, approaches to music education, which is where a lot of music educator, music administrators have come from, it was very, very much focused on performance. And I mean, leadership, I don't even know if that's in curriculum today with the, you know, some, with all arts programs, it's not like necessarily a standard. It's probably in some of the more innovative ones, but, um, you know, I think that it's not part of something that you study. Um, I think that also we are in such a scarcity mindset all the time. And we're always just $2 million away from all of our financial problems being solved forever. And we've already spent that $2 million. And that means we have to, you know, make hard choices and with, you know, for, um, forgo the professional development, you know, it's just, that's too rich for us. It, those kinds of things We're a nonprofit. Um, these stories that we tell ourselves about what's acceptable for us to have, um, I think that's the second factor. Uh, and I think that the third one is, I think that we're a pretty insular field that has not had so many opportunities to see how transformational leadership uh, in places other than the podium, because I think we've seen really transformational leaders um, change the game over the past, you know, I mean, I've been alive for 30 years, but, you know, Leonard Bernstein is one of the people, and even before him, I'm sure that there were things that were changing, but when it comes to arts administration, you don't hear those kinds of stories about people who like, created a business model that really, you know, did a great job of serving a community sustainably and giving an orchestra, you know, an opportunity to thrive. It's really just kind of been one-dimensional for the last 30 years, ever since arts administrators had to start walking back, you know, things that they promised in the 90s when they thought they could afford, you know, long-term big contracts. Um, And so I think that that has just been a conflict that's been running under the surface of um, orchestras, at least in the United States, for, I mean, at least 20 years. Um, so those are the, the three kind of things that I point to. I mean, are there others that you're thinking that maybe I'm, I'm missing or things that you've observed from your perspective? Well, yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing, Jennifer. I think um, it's, it's just so interesting how our perspectives can be also different depending on what, what part of the, you know, what part of the field we, we work in. And, mm-hmm. and I can completely, I, I hear you completely in, all the points that you made about how, especially what really struck me is the insular aspect of, of our industry. And, and I think it's, it stems from how we're trained in our education. Um, there is built-in competition from when you were five, even when, e- even if it's not spelled out for you, it, that, that um, feeling and that um, you're conditioned to to feel like everything is a competition and and then as a result there is actually a lot of fear 
that comes into play and and I feel like musicians often feel like oh if I'm not scared of something like if I'm not scared of that audition if I'm not stressed out then something is wrong like like I'm I'm supposed to be stressed out about this if I'm not stressed out I'm not working hard enough or I'm not thinking about it correctly or the stakes are not high enough or something we make up stories like you say Jennifer about how we make up stories that um help us justify our actions our behaviors and our thoughts yeah. and and it's really hard to change because we we are taught by the people who were brought up that way and then it just sort of passed down like like para- like, like like parables are passed down you know by yeah. by words and and i think that that infiltrates that that this idea of being fearful and fear needing to exist infiltrates our organizations and as a result there is not um room for discussion of leadership Mm -hmm. let alone like thinking of 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 it being on the agenda to begin with you know even if it were on the Mm -hmm. agenda i think that it's always going to be the first one to be kicked off of the list because there are other things that need to be addressed and um and i think that you know sometimes we don't think of it because the effects of leadership are long-term and it's not like that you have a solution to the problem and it's fixed tomorrow mm-hmm. and people i feel like that in our society today we lost the patience of or the or the far-sighted mm-hmm. uh, vision the the ability to see the vision of what this could be a year down the road or three years down the road and it's and so it's hard for us to take that leap. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and, you know, what you're saying about fear, I mean, totally hits home with me. I mean, we've been through a lot at the BSO in the past 18 months, both things that the world has thrown at us and things that were existing um, when I got there. And there have been so many conversations where we've had to just back up and say, you know, we're, we're working from a place of, um, fear and anticipation and anxiety over what where we were and where we are today is not in that place and we kind of have to reassure ourselves that you know we are here and we're working as a team and we do have these you know goals and we are rowing in the same direction um, sometimes that is uh, a really hard thing to pause and remember And I I mean, what you're saying about leadership not always making it onto the agenda, I I would even take that a step further to say it doesn't, it sometimes gets knocked off. I mean, what a leader is going to ask, like, does an orchestra always have to be playing 85 people on the stage at one time? Is that what an orchestra is? Or can, can we have ensembles? Can there be multiple ensembles? Can you do something else? And that's a very scary conversation that's been shut down in some orchestras and in other orchestras where they've actually had their backs against the wall. Like in Jacksonville, they had, they had a hard choice to make. And it was, you know, do we make the financial, you know, changes that we want to make, or do we hold strong to this, to just doing the the one thing. And when we made the financial changes of giving them a, a higher, um, Uh, salary in exchange for a lot of flexibility in their contract, we found ourselves in such a better position with them uh, because we were closer partners in in accomplishing our mission. And it was really meaningful and and exciting work. Um, But that was, I mean, scary stuff the first year of trying to see like, What's, what does this mean for quality? This is not what my training's in. (laughs) You know, what does, what repertoire do we play? You know, all of these kinds of things are new. And, um, you know, I'm speaking as a, you know, an administrator talking about musicians, but obviously there's so much in the administrative space that's, you know, like that. So, Justin, we're really running with your question here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Keep it, keep, keep it going. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm taking notes down for myself. <laughs> so, so you guys are good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I... Jennifer, what you were saying about how leadership doesn't even gets knocked off the list, I I I think that I, I think about that a lot because I feel like that um, there must be a reason for that besides just you know 
the traditional way that things are going and like the status quo and the and it's mm-hmm. always easier to just maintain the status quo yeah instead of say instead of saying let's do something differently um and what i'm a little surprised about always is that it there is uh there are so many positions of leadership in artistic or organizations and why is it that out of these thousands of jobs out there in the world in even just in the US why is it that this is not a bigger conversation among the people who like like why are we not having these conversations all the time and um i um i appreciate um you know like the emerging leader leaders program that you did um mm-hmm. i looked at that and i was really sad that they didn't have it this year because i really yeah. wanted to do it as well um, but it, you know, I, I think it's it's having more programs like that within the industry that yeah. engages people in the right conversations. And I think that one of the things that I find is that people are at this point a little afraid to make to have those conversations, and they don't really know the vocabulary. And and I wonder within an, w- w- within the education within the academic training at conservatories that. Um, people have started to start creating entrepreneurship departments and programs and fellowships Uh and a lot of the major music schools have started those programs and um, have put in have put an increased emphasis on arts and arts administration programs and what I'm interested in is can leadership be a facet of that and Uh will it be Um, and if if it will, what is what would it look like? Um, you know how, uh, you know, and 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 how can we and how can we um, instill this idea that everyone is a leader, not just the people who have the position titles? Yes, I mean, what is leadership? I mean, not to get esoteric, but I mean, to, if you were going to put together a syllabus for a course on leadership for you know musicians coming out of school i mean what would even be on that list right i mean at a certain point i mean the title of this is humanizing leadership right which is like a big thought right <laughs> i'm still like chewing on it um, there's a part of just being human that's being a leader right and i I think that you have to, I don't know. I think that it's hard to differentiate, you know, like what are the skills that you need to be able to manage yourself and start those new opportunities up? And then what does it take to sit down at a bargaining table and have a constructive conversation about the fact that your industry and your world is changing? You know, like at some point, somebody is going to have to have these conversations and it's going to be us. Um, And when I say us, I mean our generation. But um, what happens then? You know, is it, do you prep people with, you know, like talking to a futurist? I mean, I went to a a conversation with a a futurist at the League of American Orchestras concert or conference one year and I walked out and I was like I'm going to give you a futurist it's the coolest thing ever Uh, and it's how I shaped a lot of my attitude toward um, senior engagement programs because it's like if we build this now all these people are headed to senior engagement programs but I mean it's it's like the trend seeing and then kind of following that but I mean even more basic than that is can you identify a problem (laughs) <laughs> um, right like you know what the problem is yeah right <laughs> can really you articulate it yeah. right yeah I, I mean because I think that agreeing on what the problem is is honestly half of the problem half of the conflict uh, I mean I think that people are talking right now and, and Justin and I talked about this you know when we were preparing for this is that there's so much of a tension in a lot of ways between you know like what are we really preserving here are we are we focused on you know, sometimes at the BSO, we talk about um, what comes first, the art or the patrons. And I'm like, neither. It's the connection of the two. That's, that's what we're shaping here. And um, I, <laughs> I think that those kinds of like distractions, 
get like use up people's energy they're not the things around which you yeah absolutely (laughs) yeah yeah and i i love to add on what you just said about is it Mm -hmm. the patrons or the art is it it the art or the patrons right and i'd love to say that yes it's the connection between those and i feel like that often it's there's there there's a question of is it the patrons or the musicians and and i think that as a leader myself on the podium as a leader of the people who play on stage i am really driven to put the spotlight also on the people who make the music equally because i i feel like that a lot of times or organizations out of need and out of habit they immediately go to okay how can we increase our patron engagement how can we increase our revenue mm-hmm. stream and how can we go out there and get more customers and serve right. the customers right. and and i often see a lack of the same kind of of emphasis on how can we serve our employees and to have to to think of uh both an customer centric approach and an employee centric approach both of which have have has its merits and i often feel like that that the scales are tipped way too much to the um uh to the customer Mm -hmm. um side and and then the question becomes is it the patrons or is it the musicians and it's like we can't have both but actually we do, we can have both and right. it's just it's just a matter of where your priorities are and how you utilize the resources and how do you marry those exactly like you said it's not the yeah. art or the patrons but it's the art it's a connection between the art the patrons and right. the employees and yeah how that works definitely I, I i love this point that you're making because um it reminds me of something that I haven't thought of for a while. And it's that question of we're having so many efforts go into like, oh, here are new ways to engage the patrons. And yet we do very little to help orchestra members. I mean, once you're in an orchestra job, you're you're there, you're playing your services, you're playing more services like the the it's not generally part of an orchestra's plan to make sure that those investments are made in this workforce that has incredible tenures i mean like that is the greatest asset that any orchestra has is the people on the stage right it's who our people are there for i mean we're in a position right now where we can't even go into one of our halls it still is the bso when there is no hall there is still an orchestra and Yet, you know, we would put new carpet in the hall. Why wouldn't we, you know, spend the, the time and the money to develop? That sounds, that's crass. And I'm, I'm not trying to be <laughs> disrespectful to musicians, but like what you're talking about is like these very um, like tangible things that people can point to. And yet you're right there, you know, there's, there's a piece that's missing. Yeah, and it, you know, when, when, I, when I think about um, employee engagement and I think about um, what you know, other industries are doing in terms of supporting their employees in terms of um, um, professional development per- programs that, that they offer and, um, and just, just to not get them in the door and like in the job and then like forget about them, but to ensure that they continue to succeed and continue to grow. And one, one of the things I see in, um, in all levels of orchestral musicians is that they see the job as the end goal. Like they get the job, they're in, everything is set and then mm-hmm. and then they kind of lose the sense of oh I gotta keep growing I have to keep I mean until they they have their eyes set on a bigger job in, mm-hmm. a, in, a, in a different orchestra but it's never within yeah. that or, that orchestra of how can I progress and I feel mm-hmm. like that in other industries there are built-in mechanisms or in the last decade or or so there has been conversations about building in mechanisms to engage employees not just in the sense of like okay giving them like free food and and you know um like a rec center or something like that but it's like engaging them in in um bringing in um 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 you know um guests to talk about purpose for example Mm -hmm. and or to think about 
about different ways of engaging the musicians that help them grow as artists yeah. because not every you know, you know i i just feel like that the learning and the growth stops a, a lot of times once you get the job and i think that's a, a reason why job satis- satisfaction rates are actually so low in um, orchestral mu- musicians. I mean, there was a study done in the mid 1990s that basically revealed that job satisfaction rates for mu- for orchestral musicians among a variety of other fields are actually quite low mm-hmm. and, they, they, and they rank below that of um, prison guards and as well as flight attendants and and it's just so low and yeah. it's funny to me and like not the, the statistic of course is shocking but what yeah. was really shocking to me is the lack of solution that you know yeah. um that they what they what i found they said was uh, what they 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 cited you know across all industries three reasons for lack of job satisfaction or low job satis- satisfaction and number one is um, no control over the work environment. Like, you know, when you have rehearsals, yeah. how long the rehearsals are, where you have rehearsals, things like that. Number two is the um, no autonomy in how you do your work. And so, I mean, it, as an orchestral musician, you, you're trained to, to think, well, I do what the conductor tells me to, to do, or I do what the music on the page tells me to do. And when you're trained through your education, you're, you're being told what to do by your teacher. And mm-hmm. so... I feel like that we end up not thinking for ourselves as much as we can. And Mm -hmm. we're not trained in that, in that um, we're not practiced in the, in thinking for our ourselves. So there's a lack Mm -hmm. of autonomy. And then the third thing is the, um, the, the lack of ability to speak up when you need to. um, And, 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 and so they said those three things and it was, so funny that their solution was like oh you don't have any um control over your your workplace take up a hobby like gardening that allows you to have full control over your workplace or like the uh, other one's like oh you don't have any autonomy over your job how you do your job well take up a hobby like being a pilot like flying planes because you have full autonomy there and they were like actually saying how so many musicians statistically are pilots because it's something that allows them to have autonomy um and i just like found it so i i found that part of like that study slash article being so interesting because it wasn't solving the issue it was kind of treating the symptom and i feel like that as a result you know, 30 years later, I feel like we're not that better off in terms of Mm -mm. job satisfaction. And that's kind of sad. So like, I want to change that in some way. And um, in my work as a conductor on the podium, but also in, in my blog and the way that I engage with other people. And so, yeah, I mean, you started me off on this. I don't know why, but, um, but I'm just like really, uh, always very surprised at um talking about it it's it it was a an interesting lesson for me when i learned something similar to that um i i love hearing you go into detail about this because you clearly put you know so much thought and and research and and experience into it i heard it you know just in a snapshot when i was in the league of american orchestras um essentials of orchestra management um robert levine who is like big big union leader in the United States. Um, He was, he, I think he shared that very article because I remember being like, what, this is, I mean, I was a music major and I was in there to like be joyful as a musician, which is why I'm not successful at it. But, um, you know, I think that it's so funny to me that this, I mean, I don't know, an art form that we just all hold in such high regard can have such a low satisfaction rate. I mean, just mm-hmm. what, you know, it, it kind of raises the question, well, what is it all for? Which was a big question that came out for us, not to turn this into the old MBA sideshow, but that was, a, you know, a big thing that I've been asking a lot, what is an orchestra for? And one of the things that I was really fascinated to see that we did in Jacksonville like when I got to the Jacksonville Symphony I heard them play the uh overture to Tristan 
like four times in a season. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is terrible. Um, just because like, if I'm playing that four times a year and like Beethoven five, three times a year, cause the board wants it like, no, of course you're going to hate your job. <laughs> you know? So we, we got a new music director, um, Courtney Lewis. Have you run into Courtney by the way? I don't, know um, I, I, don't, I know the name. He was in okay. Boston. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I didn't know if Boston was yet. So anyway, he's still there. And some of the things that um, we put into place, you know, there was a musician um, professional development fund that they could apply to. Um, we had, we actually in the um, chamber music ensembles, we assigned you to an ensemble for a year, but that was it for the via or for the Jacksonville Symphony's involvement. We would schedule for them to go to certain places, but they were responsible for developing the, the the performance, you know, the picking out the music that they wanted to present and the stories that they wanted to tell around it. Um, you know, things along those lines. There were a couple of professional development pieces. And you know, I think the biggest change was what the orchestra was playing. And I'm curious about what your thoughts are. This might be getting just a little bit away from, from leadership, but I mean, I think it's still re very relevant in, you know, mission related, what are we doing? Um, we were presenting works by, we were workshopping um, new music. Um, we were playing music that hadn't been played at the Jacksonville Symphony, like ever. Um, we had one program that was like Bartok, Ligeti, and like two or three other composers and our audience was literally like, but <laughs> it was really, it was funny to see Jacksonville take this in because it, it was a little bit too big of a, a bite. Um, but those kinds of things really challenged the orchestra. And I think that the level of satisfaction um, grew dramatically. And I have to say the level of performance also grew dramatically. I mean, I've, I've heard, so many electric performances down there. And um, I'm just curious, you know, like that's one approach to it. Um, I think that that's also an approach that makes room for what our community needs, which is, you know, more representation in the music that we're presenting. So, so important. And also very you know, important for the development of musicians to be part of those stories. What, what might you have in mind that are, are some of those like solutions that that are um, are kind of coming up. And then I guess getting back to the leadership thing, what are some of the roadblocks that we're facing? I mean, like what, what are we really coming up on that, that might keep something like this from being effective? Because I think that that's where kind of the leadership breakthrough or, or lack of breakthrough keeps happening. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, that's really interesting, yeah. Um... It's, a, it's certainly given me a lot to think about um, off <laughs> no, the cuff just, here. Yeah, off, off the yeah. cuff here. I mean, I, I think that what you said about, you know, um, playing Beethoven five, five times a year because the board wants it, that like is in a nutshell, basically what <laughs> yeah. life is like, you know, that, um, you know, and, and, I, I, and I, maybe I want to start by responding to what you said earlier that, you know, you feel like that you go into music because it, you want to get joy from playing music, right? And, yeah. it, and, and it is such a trend of people leaving music because they can't find joy or, you know, or in the professional sphere. And, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and it's interesting how sometimes community orchestras have higher jobs or job satisfaction rates. They're, they're happier in, um, in um, even if they're not paid for it or it's not their, how they make a living. And, and, and I think it's the question of why they're there. Um, and, and, and you can, we, we can attack it in so many ways, but I think that mm -hmm. one of the things that we lie to ourselves is that we lie to ourselves saying that we love what we do for a living. We are so lucky as professional musicians mm -hmm. and, and it's a lie, yeah. you know, and because we, we want to believe it so badly. So we ignore the fact that we're not happy. Yeah. And so we don't do anything to tackle it. So we're hiding from, from, from the, we're, we're hiding from the problem the problem yeah. so if we're hiding from a the problem then we can't solve it because we don't recognize that it's a problem mm -hmm. and I feel like that that's the stage that where we're at now is yeah. yes there's the research yes there are the people who are talking about it and yes there are, there are people who are trying to use repertoire or use work culture or use different ways of hiring to uh to change things up 
and to in, to to improve the engagement of you know the employee engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's not I, I I feel like that there's not as much reception yet from the from the people who need who are receiving those those changes um, as employees. And so, so so some of the things that I really want to do um, as a conductor, and I've been trying things out kind of on and off with the orchestra that I conduct, which is a student orchestra. And I feel like sometimes with students, you ha- I, I have more the flexibility to experiment and do things. So, um, you know, one of the things that I have started to experiment with is allowing the people to be a part of solving problems. So often the uh, conductor is the one who's expected to know all the answers, have the solutions, and tell the musicians what to do. And it's and that's kind of how we expect things to run, right? And mm-hmm. I think that sometimes professionals really hate it when conductors ask them questions about, well, what do you think about this tempo change? Or what do you think about this? And they, they actually really hate it because, not because they don't think it's a good idea, but because they've never been asked and they don't know how to respond because they're so out of practice uh-huh. thinking for themselves, uh-huh. you know? And, and so what, that's something that I, I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to, in my rehearsing and my interactions with musicians, to, to find out how they feel and what they want. And, you know, I'm going into um, a, a series of rehearsals with professional mu- musicians at the Portland Opera in about a couple of weeks. I'm doing a production of Tosca there. Um, and also I'll be there for, you know, a month. And I'm thinking about, okay, how am I going to engage the singers in yeah. my rehearsals? And how am I going to get them, how am I going to prevent myself from falling into the trap of, of here's my interpretation. I'm going to tell you to do this you do it. If, if you didn't do it, I'm going to correct you. And that's the end of the story. Like what right. I'm like, one of the, one of the questions that I, I'm thinking about asking is um, asking, instead of saying, how, do, how, how does that feel? Um, you know, like trying to solicit an answer of, well, that felt great because I like your tempo or that felt bad because I didn't like your tempo. Um, saying something like, what surprised you about that run through? Which part was surprising to you? What which which part jumped out at you? And did 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 what we just did collaboratively made you rethink some parts of <laughs> what you did? And what are they? And like why? And just having a conversation, just opening the door to the conversation of I I'm not right all the time. I don't claim to be right all, all the time. I have an idea, but you also have ideas. So I'm curious about what your ideas are. And I've been doing that a lot with students um, mm. because I have the time and there's not, you know, like the, the, there, there, there's not sort of like the jaded, disgruntled, seasoned professional to kind of not, yeah. be, recept- not be receptive. Um, uh, so I, I'm really curious yeah. about doing things like that, that engages, that re-engages the musicians yeah. into the creative process, inviting them into the conversation. Um, and doing something after a rehearsal. Like, you know, um, there's something that the military does called the after action review, which is after every mission, they have a meeting and they talk about what worked, what didn't work, what they'll, what they'll do next time as a team, as a group led by their commander, right? So, and when I read that, I was like, why don't we do this in orchestras? Why don't we get together after every concert or every rehearsal and just say what worked, what didn't work, what can we do, ideas for solutions. It could be a quick, like, I mean, it could even be a Google form for all I know, you know, but, but I mean, it could just things like that, that engages the people so that they feel like that they have ownership over the work that they do and that their voice matters and that, and that ultimately that their work matters. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so those are just Mm -hmm. some things that come to mind. I love that. I, I love what you're describing because, you know, what I was kind of throwing out are like initiatives and what you're describing is, is just the practice of leadership. And there are so many parallels to, um, to what we experience in the office. And I think that we, we kind of deal with the same 
thing that a lot of other places deal with, which is that person who's at the top who believes that they're bringing that different level of thinking. I mean, if that's how you feel as a leader, you miss the whole point, right? And I, was, I actually just typed that in a message to somebody the other day. I was like, if they're here because they think they're thinking at a different level, I'm done. <laughs> and, um, and yet, I think that that's kind of what some people expect out of leaders too. And that vulnerability of being like, I'm not sure, you know, I don't like, I'm not just asking you this because I want you to like, I'm not posing here. Like I, I really, I really want to know because it matters. You're, you're part of this work. And I mean, that to me is like, I, I'm not even in an orchestra. And I know that that's a really, really different stance, especially because there are also so many people in the orchestra. I mean, that's, that's another piece of it too. It's just, you're dealing with such a large group of people that I think that that's maybe a, a little bit of a leadership challenge. Um, yeah, in, absolutely. Yeah. Because you can't want, you can't have everybody voice their opinions, otherwise it would take too long, right? So right. it's like finding the, finding effective mechanisms to allow people to feel like that they can have a say. And something that I read that really resonated with me is this idea that people can have a say and that that's different than having things go their way you know and like I think that we often think that oh in order to you know if we ask them for their opinion we have to do what they say as leaders but you know but I think just the act of being heard is so powerful for people who work in sort of lower ranks in the hierarchy and I think for us leaders, it's, it's important to allow that space, but also to recognize that that simply that being heard is not the same as letting them have their way. And you mm -hmm. know, as, as the leader, you still have the responsibility of doing of making that tough decision of, you know, whether to to hear them and go their way or hear them and not go their way. And and and, and I think that's one of the challenges. And maybe you know what creates conflict in the relationship between the leader and the group. And yeah, and, and just to echo what you said, Jennifer, it is so powerful to show vulnerability because it gives permission for everybody else to share it. Mm -hmm. And it when, when somebody is trying to be perfect all the time, it makes other people feel like that, that they have to try to be perfect all the time and they end mm -hmm. up hiding, they end right. up, you know, they end up covering up for mm -hmm. mistakes or problems. And it often is until too late when you recognize it, that there's a problem. Yeah. So I yeah. think the vulnerability is so important. I, so, I mean, I am smiling because I'm appreciating what you're saying. I'm also smiling because full disclosure, Lily Snortland is <laughs> on my team at the VSO <laughs> and she's been listening here. And I'm just, I'm thinking about, her, you know, listening in on this conversation. Hi, Lily. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think that it's interesting to have these conversations with team members. Like, how is it going? Are you, are you feeling heard? Because my intention is that I'm listening to you. What may actually be happening is that, you know, and I'm, I, this is hyperbole, but I'm completely wasting your time. And it's like, it did nothing for us to sit around in a room. And, you know, because you knew that coming in, I had already decided what I was going to do. And I've been in those meetings too. I mean, I've been the follower, I've been the leader. And I mean, it's just that the quality of what everybody's bringing to the table is just like, it's, it's not even a comparison. You know, it's one brain versus seven. And I mean, that's where, you know, having teams that aren't so homogenous is so important too. Um, you know, my first time around at the VSO, it was a bunch of women and now it's still mostly a bunch of women, but we're, there's a little bit more variation in our age and where we're from and our ethnic backgrounds. And, and so I am excited about the, you know, just the difference that we have now that we have, um, we've created that kind of connection and safety 
or at least I'd like to think that we have, um, that we've been able to come up with some really cool innovative stuff um, that makes an impact, I think. But um, that's the impact of leadership that involves everybody, <clears throat> um, to, I think, to your point. Right. And it's, it's so hard, right? It, you know, you like try things and sometimes it doesn't work and then you try it a different way and it doesn't work again. And I feel like that that discourages people sometimes in in mm -hmm. keeping going. And it's also the harder route. So I think that, you know, those two things combined makes it really yeah. hard to make progress in, yeah. in, in what we're talking about in this conversation. And I think that, you know, um, it's great to have that vision of what the world could look like, what the, or what the organization could look like. Um, and the hardest thing is to implement and mm -hmm. to gain traction in the, in, in the implementation. And yeah. yeah, I know that I've struggled with that as a leader is, you know, I have all these ideas and I can talk and talk and talk all I want about it, but it's like, how is it making its way into like the everyday work that I do? Do, do you find that Jennifer as like yeah. an issue for you? Well, you know, I can, I'll say less about myself and more about right now, the BSO doesn't have a CEO. We also don't have a music director. So we're just, you know, completely at the mercy of our board chair. Um, no, we, we don't have a CEO. And this is not the first time that I've been at an orchestra that doesn't have a CEO. And I think that it puts into really sharp contrast what a leader's job actually is. Right, And that is the vision, the North Star. It does not mean, a leader does not provide a roadmap. The roadmap is something that everybody's making, you know, every year, three months, six months at a time, because that's really all that we, you know, it, sorry, in arts organizations, we actually end up planning like 18 months in advance. But um, <laughs> those kinds of, of activities are not actually the thing that the CEO is the most helpful for. It's, it's the principles and the values that are going to guide all of the decisions. You know, is this getting us closer to where we want to be or further away? And in that way, it's a little bit binary. You know, like in our opinion, are we on the right track? Are we colder or hotter? Or are we colder? And I think that that's kind of the, the cool part about you know, just the art of working and that is things can be done any different way I mean you could do things the same way that somebody else has already done them and come up with a completely different result like I don't want to get esoteric about work and what it does and where it goes but I do I do think that you know when you're trying to provide that to your team the amount of resilience and flexibility that's required is, I mean, that, and, and the, the um, top shell that's required is I mean, great. That was the hardest part of me becoming a leader. And, you know, on my journey that I've been on, um, the moments where you have to be like, I just look, looked pretty stupid or like that totally missed the mark and maybe I offended somebody. Like I need to go eat, you know, eat some humble pie and get that back on track. Because in the long run, what matters the most is you know, how this employee feels about their job here or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I mean, I totally identify with the idea that, you know, it's not going to go exactly the way that you want it to. And also I'm grateful for that. Um, if I thought that everything was gonna be you know, perfect when I brought it out in front of everybody or when we started it, there would have been some, there's something inherently wrong with what my expectations were in the first place. I, maybe I left something on the table or I, you know, I could have done it in a way that got better results or made it a bigger impact in, in a way that I cared about. Um, but I think it's hard to let go of that control of what the outcome is going to be. And, and I mean, it involves risk, which gets back to scarcity. If you feel like you don't have a lot of room to wiggle, 
you're not going to take risks, mm -hmm. but you're also not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's absolutely in the case of the musician playing on stage too. Like that. I feel like one of the reasons why people get to the job and then they stop growing is because they stop taking risks because mm -hmm. they feel like that their job is at stake. Mm -hmm. And there's, and that's part of the fear is that, oh, well, if I try something different with a solo, I mean, I know I can play it and I know that it works this way, but, you know, it gets old if you play it that way for 45 times, you know, and so it, and if the leader, or the artistic leader is not there to create an, an environment where the employee is encouraged to say, well, I want to try to do it differently th this time. And, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be penalized for it, you know, it, and, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and that like leads me to think about um, something that I talked to with Justin in our prep meeting about failure and about how failure is such an important part of, uh, or the lack, our wish for there to be no failure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's su such an important part of what we are as artists. Yeah. And, you know, and me, even as non-artists, you know, there's a little bit of a perfectionist in all of us and we all want to strive for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was listening to this, really interesting idea um, by a psychologist called Amy Edmondson. She talks about psychological safety mm -hmm. and she was talking about failure and how there are two different kinds of failures. Um, there are praiseworthy failures and there are blameworthy failures. And mm -hmm. praiseworthy fa failures are failures that um, are a result of risk-taking, complexity, and experimentation. So that, that's sort of the good kind of failure. And then mm -hmm. the blameworthy failures are ones just out of incompetence or in, in, inattention, you know, like you didn't practice, you, you didn't right. prepare for this rehearsal or you were not, you know, you were not prepared or mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you overslept so you came in late. So yeah. like those, those things, and I feel like that in the music industry, we see failure as failure. <laughs> it's just failure, yeah. right? And so it's like we treat, um, the praiseworthy version and the blameworthy version exactly the same way, but with, with punishment, some sort of punishment. And so as a result, we try not to fail, but we try not, we of course try not to fail the blameworthy kind of failures, but we also end up reframing from, or uh, we end up not trying to take risks and um, because we're not, we're not rewarded for the praiseworthy kind of failures. And yeah. so I've been thinking a lot, a, a, a lot about that too, as like, how do I, in, in how I interact with the people that I work with in recognizing which kind of failures are, uh, can I reward? Yeah. And, um, and that has been really powerful for me as a leader. Yeah. To me, that raises the question of the word excellence and how hard we hold on to that in the field. I mean, like on all of my donor brochures, artistic excellence, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, Lily is our communications manager and she is, she and I have talked about like excellence. It sounds like it's so far away, but I, I think that excellence has become kind of almost like a title of a certain way of doing things and not a description of the quality of something. And um, I, I think that that is part of the risk-taking. Like, I, mm -hmm. I mean, what is something that's truly excellent and how do risks play into that? I think that if we were to be more flexible in our definition of that, again, I, I, we're getting kind of esoteric, but we're not. This is, this is the stuff that like manages our, our decisions on a daily basis. If we let go of what we think, wherever that is coming from, what changes? You know, I think a lot. I think that we become more dynamic and, yeah. and relatable and, and everything, but yeah. it's scary. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, what, what does excellence even mean for mm -hmm. you and for me? I mean, it's, I think just between the two of us, we can call excellence different things and that's okay. But yeah. we kind of, we try to fit we try to use the word excellence to encompass, you know, maybe what we think somebody else wants it to be. And, mm -hmm. and then there's the labeling. There's the, sometimes across, like you, you cross it, you don't 
um, you think the other person thinks this, but they don't. And then the other person thinks that you think this, but then you don't. Yeah. And so it ends up being not useful as a trigger for whatever you want it to be. Agree. Um, yeah. And, and, and then also, you know, I think it's also thinking about uh, what does the, you know, what do the audience really want? Like, why do they want excellence? Mm-hmm. Like, or do they even want excellence? I mean, of course we think that they do, but have we asked them if they want excellence? Like, what I'll else do they want? I'll never forget you for asking that question because <laughs> I ask that a lot. You know, when I walk away from something, I'm not gonna know if it was a technically, I mean, actually I will know, but like a normal person is not gonna know whether that was an excellent performance or not. They're gonna feel it, you know, like, that's just what we're dealing with here you know mm-hmm. if and it takes sometimes hearing something differently to go like whoa you know <laughs> like I've heard Cameron Carpenter play a few times and some people really are not I don't know if you've heard of him but he's an organist no, I haven't. kind of wild and some people are just like oh my gosh I cannot stand his style he's just like taking the organ and blowing it up and then other people are like I have never heard that like that before the people who are looking for excellence the way that we've been defining it are not going to like an artist like that but somebody else might be like I never would have even thought to play you know an entire Bach jig on just the foot pedals <laughs> and blow everybody's mind like these kinds of, of things are what stand out in people's minds mm-hmm. um and the thing that the most like crystal version of what you're talking about, like, what is that version of excellence? It drives me crazy because I don't understand it. Um, and that is audition excerpts. Mm. I just feel like that's, that's the one where like everybody wants you to play it. Like you were this person who played it first, you know, 80 years oh, ago. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't get me started about audition excerpts. Like, I feel like <laughs> auditions are one of the reasons why we are having this conversation yep. you know and like it needs to go like the yeah. way that we do auditions needs mm-hmm. to you know and, and just like you just go and like google or read you know any article about how you know what kinds of uh, uh about what kinds of new questions you should be asking um in your hiring processes or how you sh- or mm-hmm. you know companies that really try to um hire for culture fit or or value fit you know like we're just completely not doing that we're we're taking a snapshot of how this person is playing here on this day and we are assuming everything about that person based on that thing and it's a very finite mindset if you know um simon sinek and his idea of uh, or it's not his idea but he wrote a book called the infinite game and um and he talks about how the you know we we often reward employees based on metric and we have an arbitrary date and arbitrary goal and if that person hits it then they get rewarded but we don't know what their their track record of growth is like and Mm -hmm. you know we we don't and and somebody could be all over the place and on that random day they happen to perform really well oh yeah and but then but then they could be just all over the place and whereas you really want someone who um is growing like this but then maybe on the day of the audition they're just a little bit shy a little little short of that goal but then that date is an arbitrary date so but you know that in two weeks they're going to get to that point and you want that person but you know in our uh, in our uh, audition processes we don't measure that yeah. we we can't measure or i mean i like to think that we can that that there may be ways that we can but mm-hmm. at, the, at the moment we're not we're just yeah. we're just it's just an arbitrary goal that's an arbitrary date and it's a little sliver and we don't ask people about their values and we don't talk to them mm-hmm. about what our organizational values are and whether, whether they're a good fit right. um and and i have this um this um idea that you know if we were to able to be able to match values of performers with values of orchestras and and you know um, higher based on that I like to think that you know that things would probably fall into place evenly across all the 
organizations with other people, m- much more than saying like having 800 people audition for the New York Phil and that one position in the, in the New York Phil, regardless of whether uh, yeah. they're, you know, the things align in terms of um, right. goals and a mission yeah. and value. And yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's a future fireside chat, Christina. We're going to talk about um, farm team orchestra leagues. <laughs> this is always like oh. you know, <laughs> well I mean it's not worth getting into now but basically yeah. you know how like you have the major league baseball teams and then yeah. you have the next tier down and then the next tier down these uh. happen because people you, you can see the players at each of these levels and they get called up when they're needed and and mm-hmm. you know who you're getting and you know how they played in an ensemble and it's not actually like I like to joke about it, but I also am not kidding that something that gave people a chance to, you know, really move up would, I think, make a big mm-hmm. difference. Um, but like I said, that's like different conversation. I have, yeah, I have ideas about that. You have ideas about that. <laughs> I know Justin's probably looking at the time, being like, "All right." <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is this has been great. I feel like I almost didn't I really kind of didn't have to be here I could have gone to sleep early so <laughs> uh, no I I love I love how how this conversation carried on and I think um I mean I can kind of okay so we have like seven minutes left um I think what we'll do is uh if anybody has questions in the audience you guys can type it in the chat Meantime, I'm going to try to summarize kind of the overall stuff that that I I took away from from what you guys are saying, um, because you guys are basically just answering the questions that I was going to ask like, in the order. Like it was great. Like it just you guys kind of unpacked it all. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, but in general, it's like I think we can start from like what is bad leadership slash why are orchestra members sad. Like that's kind of what we dug into for a bit. And I feel like Mm -hmm. a lot of that was um, the lack of control over work environment, lack of autonomy, uh, misalignment of vision. And then in terms of like a leader, like bad leadership, I think the easiest way to sum that up is like dictatorship. Like that usually doesn't help. Um, Like any kind of, like like the example of Tiffany that you gave of like, this is my interpretation of the music, you do it right or I'm gonna correct you. Like that just completely destroys your your members. Like there's no, there's no, it just kills the energy and and the the motivation and the joy. Um, And then also a big thing that sounded like a problem was uh, just generally like stagnation. Like whether that's an inability to to rise up um, uh, as an orchestra member, or just like playing the same songs over and over again and not not being able to take risks, just like just stagnation. It it, it and it makes a lot of sense. I think that that makes a lot of sense. The other side thing was the the outdated cultures. Um, you guys mentioned like outdated like audition culture. Uh, which that makes a lot of sense. Like I, I, I remember when I did auditions when I was in orchestra in high school and it was just, it just was not fun. And so much pressure on like 30 seconds. Um, and it all, it all gets judged there. And it makes so much sense that that doesn't make sense to, to judge somebody who you're gonna be hiring with, with so many different factors of what they could be going through. Um, uh so let me put a button on there and try to see what this question was um so this is from lily your friend jennifer uh so she says i'm very interested in the dismantling of insularity um and for some people that means just studying other industries um or other disciplines like psychology and visual arts and she's saying she's curious about other philosophies that are rooted more deeply in humanity uh, and defining and protecting that, like decolonial thoughts being implemented in nonprofits. Um, 
and she's curious about hearing that piece out more. How far in the industry are you willing to go in uplifting of human dignity? This is a big topic. Uh, where can dangers from other industries come into play, uh, such as looking into business or other industries? How does that fit into your leadership of employees? Um, if you guys want to take a crack at that over the next five minutes, I think that can, uh, I'll carry it from there into kind of summarizing what I got for what, what good leadership is. And then we can wrap it up there. Well, thanks, Lily. <laughs> um, I love this question. Uh, Tiffany, do you, do you have a, something that you want to kind of respond to with this? I, I want to give you a chance since Lily's not usually working with you every day. <laughs> well, Lily, thank you for the question. Um, I feel like I, I, I would want to work with you every day. Um, and I look forward to the day that I can. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of still digesting the question because it is a really um, loaded and really important question. I, I, I do think that, um, that there's, there is a need actually uh, to cross pollinate ideas between industries. Like I really do feel like that, that that's really, really important, but there's also the danger of cross pollinating the ideas that didn't work in other industries too. So, I think thinking about in well this idea of humanity, like I, I feel like that's the that's the that's the built that's the million dollar question of how do we bring humanity into the workplace, both in other industries but also in I think our industry where humanity has been taken out, it has been teased out, and and I think that often we think of, I mean, that just the way that we talk about the industry and our higher and our hierarchy about how people are there mostly as a cog in the machine to serve something, you know, like uh, something that Jennifer, you said at the very beginning of our conversation that really, really struck me. And, and I never realized this, but it's like, you know, you, you said the musicians go in for services and I'm like, yeah, that that's what we call our work we call them services and like why do we call them services who are we serving what are we serving and 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 if we think about our musicians simply as servants being there to service something and then like i also think about just our the idea of subs and how subs are to fill a hole and like anybody could be replaceable that you know i mean i there, there's of course validity in having subs but just the way that things work it it, it doesn't protect the humanity of the, the individual you know if if somebody is sick or has to be out you have 15 other flute players lined up to fill that spot and that doesn't make the person feel very important so i guess this idea of humanity and 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 treating people like individuals and finding ways to do that i guess it's a very it's not directly answering a question but i guess i'm just saying that that this idea of bringing humanity back into our industry is really important. And I think about it all the time. Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, sorry, I'm slightly distracted because my dog's like getting in my face. Um, <laughs> I, I agree. I think that the the smaller things, like the language that we use um, can be dehumanizing, especially like what you were just saying. I mean, great examples in, especially the way that we talk about orchestra members. Um, I mean, the just the entire like collective bargaining situation, I think can be <laughs> dehumanizing. Um, I think that from an administrative staff standpoint, um, I do think that that actually follows the more innovative um, business cultures that I think are evolving in other places in the country. I mean, like, I think that there is a lot to be learned from people who understand how this works. And I, I know that that's kind of like a cop-out answer, but I, I mean, I just think that I, I mean, I think that there are like, if you, if you're looking at 
the the way that you're going to develop your employees, you're thinking about what service you're giving them. It's not just a paycheck it, and it can't be because otherwise you're not going to be able to keep your, your staffs, right? So I think that seeing people as being whole humans who have lots of interests and how they can bring those into the job, I think that that's just part of honestly being an effective manager and leader. Um, and I think it's hard work and I think it varies wildly and I think that that's what makes it so hard to say like about a whole industry how do we do this I would have to say that we should invest in management and leadership development which we said right at the very beginning there is not enough of um I'm sorry that's not a really specific like hard-hitting answer but I don't know that that's something that you just like can you know, apply to an entire industry. I think that we just really need that development. Sorry, that took a lot of words to say. Well, not I, think, I think it's also that we just don't know what we don't know. So yeah. if we don't know to look for it as a problem, then we don't even see the problem. And we're so distracted by other things, like making sure that we have a season or making sure that we have, that we're financially sound or, you know, and... And, and I do think that, you know, um, Jennifer, you mentioned, you know, bargaining and, and I think, you know, I think, I think, you know, um, that there's a, an issue with, you know, or I always wonder why unions exist or why unions exist to protect the people from its own people, you know, largely like, and, and as a conductor, I'm, I, I am super aware of of you know rights that orchestral musicians have that have been created as a result of them being treated poorly yeah and and i just wonder like how can we dismantle that that because if we have that structure i mean you know the union should exist but it should be protecting the people from outside sources right not from its own people you know, and, and I just wonder, you know, maybe that's a step forward in, in putting everyone on the same team rather than dividing the people within the, or, the organization into different teams or sorry, yeah. in, into, into different sides. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We talk about this all the time. Management. Don't, don't call me management. My name is Jennifer. Like mm -hmm. this is, this is not a, an appropriate way to be, you know, talking about people who are yeah, we're all working on the same thing so right yeah. yeah i think the point about not knowing what we don't know is a really important listening role that we need to be doing much much more of in our communities <clears throat> okay and then uh, yeah. we got one more question uh from aaron um asking if there should be any if you guys would recommend that there should be any syncing or relationship collaborations between leaders in the orchestra, like section leaders of principals and the leaders in the management. Uh, and how much should orchestra leaders be responsible for people's people management duties? So I'm wondering if this is going beyond the players committee kind of structure that a lot of orchestras have, um, where the orchestra, you know, um, nominates a group of six, 10 players. And sometimes they have more than one committee. Maybe it's like the players who are talking about the union agreement and then others who are on like an artistic advisory committee. You know, I, I think that that's one pretty common um, method of collaborating. Um, and I'm not sure if that's where, if that's what that question was getting at or if there was something else that was deeper, feel free to add comments if I'm not speaking to it. But I think that the fact that the orchestra chooses those representatives to, to do that work and that it changes regularly is a really healthy practice. Um, because you can change up who's represented. Hey, Erin. Hi. I think also um, we have a musicians committee, uh, but they are not always the principals who may decide or evaluate how they play as a team. Mm -hmm. So you get one group of people who say perhaps, you know, uh, 
bring out your concerns about uh, perhaps your time, uh, the time commitment and, and things like that, perhaps more management. But then the person who evaluates your playing and how you perform within your team, within your section, is the principal. So, um, yeah, and all these are uh, part of evaluation of how the orchestra member does, right? The performance and also a sort of a leadership. Yeah. So, wondering how, how does that work then? Hmm. Or, I, I, I missed that last part. Um, how do how do the lead, how do the section leaders how can they be so for the committee, right? So so for example, okay. if the orchestra musicians, I mean every year they, they need to get their contract renewed and things like that, they are evaluated on a couple of different factors. Uh, their performance, how they, they work with the team and things uh, and, and such com commitment contributions to the orchestra. And those to, that are evaluating them artistically uh, may not be in the musicians committee. So um, the musicians committee would work sort of closely with the existing management or the orchestra management but perhaps not so much the principles to evaluate their performance. So is, should, is this something that should all come together or we keep it separate? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I feel yeah. that for principles, right, because they evaluate uh, directly who is in their team and who plays, then should they be given more uh, people management duty other than mm. the musicians from yeah, I think communication is the key, is, you know, you can have um, well-established uh, mechanisms in place of putting the right people in the right places to do the, to do the e e evaluation and also to be on the committee, but if there's not effective communication happening and and evaluation happening, then that will not work either. Um, on, on the contrary, if you have different people in different positions and may, maybe those positions are not as well uh, designed maybe in the organization and then they're kind of built to not talk to each other, you can always create pathways for them to, to talk to each other. And whether that's formally or informally, probably formally, but I do think that the ability, the, 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 the creating space for the communications is mm -hmm. what's going to prevent um, you know, um, miscommunication, like just, just, just not getting information across to the other side, or um, the or the the fear that comes from um, not being uh, not being in a situation where things might be fair, or 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 where you wonder whether things are fair. Mm. I think that that's well put, Tiffany. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're we're at uh, about five minutes left, so I think now's a good time to start wrapping up. Um, and yeah, I feel like so we went through a lot of the problems, and then uh, and then we also got into a little bit of the specifics of like how we might create some syncing um, and aligning a vision within the orchestra. I think that kind of rolls over into all the rest of the things that um, that you guys have talked about in terms of like what makes good leadership. And I think um, uh, among that is being able to define the problem. That sounds like a really big one. Uh, not just define it, but to like even just like get into a state where you can admit um, admit the problem. Um, and then that kind of overlaps with the ability to articulate the problem or, and also to ask the right questions. Um, all of that, all of that, it sounds like helps everybody in the room to, to, to get on the same page, to unify. Um, another thing you guys mentioned was to not forget to care about your musicians. 
Um, and that's not to say not to uh, not to completely ignore your patrons, but definitely care about your musicians. And that's that's something that I saw. I heard you guys put a lot of emphasis into um, to to the 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 connecting with them at at a human level. The sincere how are yous that sounds pretty key. Um, like, like, how are you doing really? Like, like, how are you doing? Like that, that's, it seems like such a simple thing, but, but the way you guys brought it up, um, I, I could feel it. Like you, like just imagining being in that space where like you get pulled aside and, and, and then the person that you're working on there is just like, dude, how are you? Like, what's going on? Like I could feel the difference that could make um being able to say i don't know that's a really big one i could see i could see that being very empowering and that relates to um going off the conventional or outdated model of of what a leader is um as being somebody who knows all the answers and has has all the right interpretations to to actually give up that power and be curious about other people's ideas, um, to ask your musicians about their opinions about certain passages, um, and even develop a, a skill around that. That that seems like something that could be very very helpful, um, and also easier on you because there's you don't have to solve everything on your own. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so strange. It's so, it's so like, it seems so obvious, but also strangely counter conventional. Um, but yeah, that sounds, that sounds really, really good. And then um, that also just relates to like the creation of the right kinds of environments or the right kinds of moments where, where visions can be clarified, where everybody can be can get on the same page and unify, um, where people feel safe to take risks. Um, Tiffany mentioned uh, taking after the model of, I think it was called the after action report. After action review. Mm -hmm. yeah. Review. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just like how people, um, how people to, to like honor people's opinions and, and the thoughts of, of of what what they did and and to actually make people feel like their thoughts matter and that their work matters um and then also the ability to swallow your pride owning your mistakes as you mentioned jennifer just like knowing when you actually did something that you need to go make amends for mm -hmm. um that's that's tough. That's really hard, especially if it happens frequently. <laughs> and so the emotional and the emotional and the pride resilience really it just really needs to kick in as a leader. Um, and then uh, the, the really cool one, uh, making distinctions between blame worthy failures and praise worthy failures. I think that's really cool. Um, and I think that goes into creating and fostering the right kind of environment where, where the culture has developed language where you guys even have that distinction, blameworthy and praiseworthy failure. Um, that's so big because that opens up the environment for people to take risks. It, it, it de-stagnates. Um, and a lot of what you guys are saying was that the variety, um, variety really creates this room for something new to emerge and, and more aliveness to come through. Um, and that kind of, I think wrapping all that up is, it sounds like the, the key thing is just to treat people, not to forget that the person in front of you is an individual and not a replaceable cog. Um, that, that kind of puts the button on, I think all of this. Um, those are all my notes. Uh, thank you guys for all of that. That was a great conversation to, just eavesdrop on. I don't 
I didn't really get to do anything, <laughs> but this is, I think this is what I would prefer moving forward. Um, and I'm really glad that you guys um, had some to talk about and so much, uh, so much uh, compatible and complimentary um, so like life experiences that, that could feed off each other. Um, so thank you guys for thank you. Thank you, Justin. spending your time thank with everyone us. Everyone for being here. Yeah, thanks everybody. This was really fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer, for Thank you, Tiffany. It was great. For the conversation. It's yeah. Really great. Yeah. And I look forward to more. Yes, for sure. For sure. Yes. We'll we'll follow up with you on that question, Lily. <laughs> we'll yes. have a whole like chat about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thanks so much for your, your leadership in this, Justin. Yeah, uh, of course, I think. <laughs> um, and thanks for the audience members, Lily, Tenyin. Thank you guys for showing up. Aaron, Christina, of course, as always, thanks for the support. And yeah, have a great night. Have a great morning. Have a great day. Um, and we'll connect with y'all soon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.